Hello RPG fans, welcome to the realm of unlimited imagination. If you're like me, you love to think about what character you might play next in your favorite role-playing game. So today we're going to go through a build all the way from levels 1 to 20, explain all the decisions along the way. This build is meant for the 2024 Rules for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. So I will present to you today Lady Archon, the Whimsical Warlock. This is a standalone character, but it's also meant to be one of the characters in a four-person group that I'm building called Azarin's Aspirants. So this will be the first character. Please remember, as we get started, hit that like button and do subscribe to the channel. Both of those things help me a lot. They help more people see this content, and I would really appreciate it if you could do that for me. We also see some pictures throughout this presentation. I'm going to try to give you an idea of what Lady Archon looks like, at least in my mind's eye maybe as inspiration for somebody if they choose to play this character. But um, leave me a comment below if you like the art or if you don't like it. Uh, I'm always looking for all kinds of feedback to try to make this better and more entertaining. So the Warlock concept. I believe that in the 2014 rules, the idea of the Warlock lacked a personality. I, I felt like when I even when I read the character description and the skills and abilities, it felt like this character that was good to add a level, sometimes maybe up to five levels, to a different class where you could take advantage of all of the good stuff that Warlock gets at very low levels. They also got their subclass at level one, which was extremely powerful in 2014 rules. So you could take a character like a sorcerer, a paladin, bard, add a little bit of Warlock in it, and then you kind of had to fight with this idea that you made a pact with somebody and you had to try to break your pact. I saw a lot of players trying to do that. But I think in 2024 rules, the personality has changed a lot. The packs don't look like they're that negative anymore. They're kind of presented as, you know, you made a bargain and uh, here's the abilities and skills that you get for that. So I think it's, uh, it's a lot smoother. There's a lot more stuff at mid-levels, let's say between 5 and 12, that really make the Warlock interesting to keep taking levels in that class. So I'm really excited with the 2024 Warlock. I don't think it's ridiculously overpowered, but I think it has a much better personality now. The low number of spell slots for this also, at least for me, it gives me a different feeling of how this character should be played. We can't just walk into combat and blast spells everywhere. Our good packed level spells have to be saved for high impact spells or reaction spells. Some of the reaction spells that you can take on a Warlock like Counterspell and Hellish Rebuke are potentially very powerful, very influential in the course of combat. So we're gonna save our spells for really good reactions. And in that way, we can just build a character that fights like a fighter and just has these really powerful reaction abilities that come on top. I love it. I love the, I, the feeling for a new warlock for me is really good. Just as a reminder, we're gonna do roll targets for everybody. We're gonna do damage, support, control elements, discovery and solving elements, and social interaction. And that means that for this character build, if you're sitting at a table where you need more support and control. This would be a wonderful character to build. This is a spell slinging bruiser. Uh, the damage on this could be a 10 out of a 10 in a round where all you have to focus on is damage. But I do think this character is often going to have to cast spells or do things on their turn to be a better tank. So we'll put the damage overall at 6, the support at a 7, uh, and it's a very self-supporting character so a lot of what you can do is going to support yourself as well as the group control fantastic control good tanking exploration isn't so good problem solving we'll be able to help with a lot of stuff but not really solve a lot of the stuff ourselves with the investigation and skill roles like that and this is meant to be a character that has influence we're going to give it seven out of ten going to be trained in intimidation, deception, and per, uh, persuasion, all three. But we're not going to have expertise, so we can't really give ourselves a 10 out of 10. But this is a character that's meant to be making the roles in the Azern Aspirants group. The new rules for backgrounds make it challenging to pick a background that gives you good skills and also a good feat you want with the stats that you need for your character. Uh, for this character in particular, really becomes difficult to get all all of three of those things to work out together right but interestingly i've heard a lot of people complain about this and say you know if especially if you go into the character builder you're kind of stuck 
picking one of the backgrounds that's in the character builder. It's not as easy to customize uh, for newer players or intermediate players who don't know how to get into the character sheet and customize them. So a human is a solution for that, right? If you have a background feat that you really want, but you can't get it with the background that you need to take for your skills and abilities, you could just take human, grab that extra origin feat, and have whatever origin feat you want. Archon's gonna be an example of that. We really want to have the wizard initiate background feat. We really can't get it within the background or anything that we want in that way, right? So we have to pick a good background for stats and skills. And then we're just gonna take human, that'll give us an extra origin feat. We can take that magic initiate wizard and we'll be happy. So with that in mind, knowing that we're gonna be a human, kind of knowing what our background is gonna be, let's talk about Archon's personality. She's the daughter of a minor noble. She's gonna run off for a short period of time in, in her youth. She's got the call to adventure, so off she goes. She falls in love with her party's leader and uh, decides to marry him and settle down. She has noble duties to discharge, so she goes back home, starts raising the kids, and uh, everything's going along well. They have a wonderful life. But then uh, recently, you know, there's been a tragedy. Her husband didn't make it back from an adventure. So after she's done with her mourning period, being sad about the whole thing, she starts to get increasingly angry and starts to think that there's some kind of suspicious circumstances around his death. So she starts looking into that. By now the children are grown, they're out of the house. And she's going to go look for answers. And the clues lead her to this fae spirit, Azaran. So she's a middle-aged noblewoman. She's got a lot of energy. I imagine this character just, just full of personality, right? She's confident, competent, has a lot of positive thoughts. She loves giving other people compliments. But also she's a little bit flighty. And if you mention something about her husband or the circumstances of her death or in any way insult her or her children, she might be also very quick to anger and kind of lash out at people and, and set some boundaries on what's okay and not. Um, she's going to be kind of a whimsical character, right? Not in a bad way where she's going to be annoying for everybody, but she needs to be occasionally unpredictable, at least in the personality that I've built in my mind. I think of her a little bit like Karaman from the Dragonlance series when we meet him in the second set of books and he's been out of the adventuring life for a while, puts on some weight, his armor doesn't fit him anymore. So maybe she's a bit like that. She digs the armor out of the treasure chest in the back of her closet, puts it on, and uh, we get this kind of feeling that she's maybe lived a good life for uh, a while, but now she's ready to get back to adventuring. There's also gonna be a little trinket and she's got this little stone dragon. Uh, trinkets are introduced in the 2024 rules. You give your character just some little thing to, to help with your character backstory. So with that in mind, we're gonna give her this little stone dragon, to dragon totem and she's gonna talk to it, ask it for advice. And it's gonna have role-playing impact later on, which is fun. Her species is human, which again, medium size. We're gonna pick 30 feet base movement speed. We're gonna gain here heroic inspiration whenever we take a long rest. That's okay, but it's not fantastic. Skillful, we get a skill proficiency of our choice and then that extra origin feat. I think humans are weak on a scale of one to 10. I would give them a six out of 10 in terms of the new character species in 2024, uh, maybe even a five. So they really don't have much to offer. A lot of the other species are more fun and flavorful, but if you need this extra origin feat, human is gonna be your default, and you have to take um, a little bit less exciting species to get what you want. So in this case, we're gonna do that. We're gonna take Magic Initiate Wizard. We're gonna take Toll the Dead. Uh, True Strike could be an interesting cantrip. We could take something different, better, press the digitation, whatever you want there. Uh, I do think Toll the Dead is good to start with though. So take that one, and for sure we want to take the shield spell. You could also take find familiar or other things if that's what you wanted to do, but for this build, I really want that shield spell as part of how we play this character. Uh, with the skill, we're going to take stealth, and this character is not meant to be a stealthy character. We're going to wear heavy armor that's going to give us disadvantage on stealth. So this isn't about being good at stealth. This is about making your stealth rolls less bad for the party. There's also ways like Mithril or Mastercrafted Armor 
where we could potentially get rid of the disadvantage on our heavy armor. And if that's the case, then we really would have uh, skill and stealth, and that could, could help the party in some ways. There's lots of backgrounds that have charisma as a stat. We really need charisma as our main stat, but nothing that has a good combination of the right ability scores, feats, and useful skills. Entertainer looks pretty good. I like musician for giving everybody inspiration. It's, it's pretty nice. But I feel like you give up an awful lot for this kind of little situationally helpful thing. So it's a good group skill, but the skills aren't really... The skills that come with Entertainer I don't think are good for this particular character. Hermit could be okay, but then the healer feat is really wasted. If you were playing a Celestial Warlock, for example, then Hermit would be the background I would take. But on this particular Warlock, it's the healer feat's not going to be that great, and I think it's wasted. Merchant could also be a legitimate option, but what we're going to take is Noble. I think it fits with how I want to play Archon, uh, so we build Noble into her backstory. She's a minor Noble. Um, so as she's built here, she's going to go into a four-person party. That, per that four-person party doesn't have an int caster, so we can take the skilled feat that comes from Noble, and we can build out some skills that we wouldn't normally get as a Paladin or Warlock. We'll get Arcana, we'll get Deception, we'll get Investigation. For Investigation, mostly we want to be able to help with those roles. For Deception, we want the skill. For Arcana, again, gives us a chance to know magical things or help other characters with those roles. History and Persuasion are both relevant skills for the character as we're going to play it, so that fits in well. The gaming set that comes with Noble can be fun if your GM leans into it, but otherwise it's a pretty useless uh, tool. For class, we're going to take Paladin at level 1. That's going to give us the heavy armor. Spellcasting. Uh, Paladins do get spellcasting at first level in the 2024 rules, and I can't even explain to you how good this is. Okay, We're going to have that shield spell. We're going to get spells from the first level of spellcasting. That's going to give us up to three times a day that we can use the shield spell all the way uh, at level 1. It's really fantastic. We're also going to get Lay on Hands. That gives us some support for the group. We can restore hit points to ourselves or other characters. One hit point is the difference between laying on the ground or standing up, so it could be a really big deal to have those five hit points. We're, uh, we're going to take Weapon Masteries and Great Axe. This party has a little bit of a gimmick where if we put two characters within five feet of each other, the party's going to excel, and one of... Archon's contributions to that idea is using a great axe with the weapon mastery to cleave and getting some extra attacks that way. We're also going to take topple with the trident. I think at early levels there's a lot of reasons why you might want to tip your enemies over and make them prone. It gives advantage to other characters who can attack them within five feet, so let's, let's go ahead and take that. Um, for spells, we're going to take Bless and Purify Food and Drink. Situationally, Purify Food and Drink could be useful. You're invited to a banquet by a bunch of people you don't trust. You might just purify the food and drink before you eat it just to make sure that you're not being poisoned. So it could be fun for roleplay. We get the Bless spell, but we're not really going to cast it. We're pretty much going to save our spell casting for our reaction spells with this character. But we have it, especially at low levels, we may need to carry cast Bless for a uh, combat so it's there if we need it intimidation and athletics for the skills out of our class topple with trident says if you hit a creature with a weapon you can force them to make a con save the dc is equal to eight plus the ability modifier used to make the attack roll on a failed save the creature has prone condition our dc at level one is only 10 you know eight plus the ability modifier oh plus the proficiency bonus so be dc 12 our strength is plus two and our um proficiency bonuses too so we'll be able to you know have some chances to, to topple characters cleave says if you hit a creature with a melee attack using this weapon you can also make a melee attack roll with the same weapon against the second creature within five feet of the first that's also within your reach on a hit the second creature takes the weapon's damage but don't add the ability modifier with two weapon fighting you basically get the same thing you can attack and then attack again with your offhand and you don't add your ability bonus. But in this case, if it's two different enemies within five feet of each other, you can attack the first enemy and the second enemy when you attack them, you're using a weapon that has a D12 damage dice. So it has higher potential to do damage than two weapon fighting at low levels. But 
it has to meet the requirements that two enemies are standing within five feet of each other, which is going to be pretty infrequent. So it's better when you get it, but you won't get it that often. For ability scores, we're going to use 15 in strength, seven points with a plus one from our uh, and again, this is the point by method, so we're going to spend seven points to get a 14, add plus one from our background to get 15. Dexterity and intelligence, we're both going to have two points in those to get them to 10. For constitution, we'll have seven points and take that to a 14. We'll spend the rest nine points in charisma, add a plus two to that to start out with 17. Let's take a look at our skill inventory. Uh, we're going to start out with quite a lot of skills, right? Because that skilled feat gives us three extra skills that we get to pick from. So we're going to have Deception, Persuasion, and Intimidate, all three at plus five, right here at level one. Athletics will be at plus four. We'll have Arcana, Investigate, History, and Stealth, all at plus two. And again, those are so we can make proficient roles with those skills or help other people in, in making those checks. Equipment at level one, we're going to cash in the 150 gold from Paladin and the 50 gold from Noble. We're going to buy ourselves a Great Axe. We're also going to have a Shield and Trident. Be careful with the Shield and Trident because... Technically, if you have both hands full at level one and you try to cast a reaction spell that has a semantic component, you, according to the rules, you can't do it because you don't have a free hand for the semantic component. So it's if your GM just allows it and doesn't really go so strictly by the rules, you could do a shield and trident. If they are strictly by the rules, just use the trident. Don't use the shield or use the shield and use a free hand to grapple. Either one of those lets you still cast your reaction spells. Chainmail costs 75 gold. That's going to be a big chunk. With the rest of the gold, we're going to want to pick up a holy symbol. Again, uh, we need a holy symbol to cast some spells. You can get a priest pack, a gaming kit, a climbing kit. And anything left over, you want to save. This character does not have dark vision. Uh, humans come with no dark vision. Goggles of Night is an easy solution to that. It gives you dark vision without an attunement slot so that's the first item that you want to get on this character that and a plus one weapon of course but but uh you could start saving up for those right away at level two we're going to multi-class into warlock 2024 rules don't give you a subclass at level one like it used to uh, but we can now take pack to the blade invocation and basically have what we used to get from hexblade just as our first level invocation so the pact of the blade invocation says as a bonus action we can conjure a pact weapon in our hand simple or martial melee weapon which we have a bond we can also bond with a magic weapon as long as it's not someone else attuned to it or another lock warlock bonded with it can't share a bonded weapon until the bond ends you have proficiency with the weapon and you can use it as a spell casting focus Whenever you attack with the bonded weapon, you can use your charisma modifier for the attack and damage rolls instead of strength or dexterity. And you can choose to have the weapon deal necrotic, psychic, or radiant damage. So this is going to do a ton of different things for us, right? It's going to take away the need to have a magic weapon. If something requires magic to be damaged, we could just do necrotic or psychic damage to the enemies um, already just by bonding our weapon. Notice... Previously in Hexblade, you used to have your packed weapon. It was kind of the weapon that you used with your specific packed abilities. This just says a simpler martial melee weapon of your choice. So you touch it, two-handed, heavy weapon, one-handed, light weapon, finesse. Nothing is specified. Just touch a simpler melee mar uh, or martial weapon. So you don't even have to carry a trident at this point if you don't want to. You can summon it with a bonus action, throw it, and let it go away, and the next turn, you can use a bonus action to reattune to your great axe and have your great axe as your weapon. Or you can summon a great axe if you don't have one. So it's incredibly flexible. With a bonus action, you can basically pick any weapon that you're not currently uh, using as a packed weapon and just make it your packed weapon. It seems so powerful. Later, if you have multiple magic weapons, you don't have to convert them to your packed weapon like you used to. You just touch your great axe, and it's your packed weapon for now. And later, if it makes more sense to have a different packed weapon, just touch it as a bonus action. That becomes your, your packed weapon. Really flexible, really fantastic. Um, and remember that the topple also works if you throw the trident. 
So as weird as it seems, you can summon the Trident, you can throw it using your charisma skill as attack and damage rolls, and use your charisma uh, also as the ability score for topple. Pretty cool stuff. Lots of cool interactions here. We're also going to pick up Cantrip. So we'll take Eldritch Blast, that signature Warlock Cantrip. We're also going to take Blade Ward, and we're going to make a lot of use of Blade Ward. The rewording for Blade Ward, I think people are sleeping on it. It is really good in 2024 rules. We're going to take Hex and never use it. We're going to take Hellish Rebuke and use it situationally. So let's take an inventory of our spell slot capabilities at level 2. Remember we took the shield with Magic Initiative. That gives us one free casting of shield per day with that uh, feat. We also have two first level paladin spell slots that could be used to shield. And we have one spell slot for warlock pack spells. Uh, we, we get a second slot already at level two. So we only get one slot, but it does recharge on a short rest. So the first time you use a shield spell in combat or a hellish rebuke in combat, use your warlock slot for that. And that way, next time you take a short rest, you'll get that slot back. And in that way, you can cast shield three, four, five times a day. Uh, which is pretty fantastic for a second level character. You can also cast Bless if needed, but we're really going to focus on those reaction spells. In, uh, in terms of out of combat, we have investigation that we can help with, knowledge checks, anything that needs influence we're going to be really good at. In terms of role playing, uh, Archon is just, I, in my mind, again, she's going to be obnoxiously nice. It's going to be so fun, given all the other characters in the group a lot of co uh, compliments and, uh, you know, pushing them along and, and encouraging them. Um, I love the idea of her being trained in stealth and she tries a stealth roll and gets disadvantaged and her armor messes everything up. And she's just like, oh, I know how to do this. It's just so hard in this armor. You know, just I, I think the role playing uh, possibilities in and out of combat here are, are a lot of fun. For level two, in combat, we're going to use Blade Ward as our concentration spell. We're going to prepare that ahead of time. It's a cantrip, and you can reasonably argue that unless the party is sneaking up on something and specifically trying to use stealth, you could be casting Blade Ward every 30 seconds on yourself, and you should have, you know, some rounds of Blade Ward prepared as you run into combat. Talk it over with your GM, see what they will allow. Some cantrips like this, like Shillelagh, uh, GMs don't allow you to cast. You have to cast it on your first turn of combat. But if your GM allows it, prepare it ahead of time. Use it as a combat prep spell. Blade Ward says, until the spell ends, attack rolls against you have minus 1d4. It doesn't say melee attacks. It doesn't say ranged attacks. It just says attacks against you. That means that spell attacks, firebolts, Anything that requires an attack roll against you is going to have minus 1d4. At low levels, with a decent armor class, you're already hard to hit. You have a shield spell. And the combination of a shield spell with Blade Ward means as long as you don't want to get hit, you're pretty much only going to be hit by crits, even at this low level. It's really pretty good. Um, and we're not using our concentration for something else, so we might as well. When we get into combat, we're going to want to get to the front line. But we're not in that big of a hurry to get to the front line. We can always take a dodge action and move forward. <laughs> dodge action gives characters disadvantage. They have a minus 1d4 and you have a shield. You could walk into a field of archers with confidence. We can also prepare for a reaction like shield or hellish rebuke. If we're at range, we're going to move in, use Eldritch Blast or Toll the Dead, and just deal damage. We're completely happy just moving forward our movement, casting a cantrip. Maybe we adjust our pack weapon. We've still got a reaction spell if needed. We don't have to rush. If we're able to engage, move forward, attack with your great axe. Could true strike too with the great axe at this point, but since we can already change our damage types with our packed weapon, I think true strike is only beneficial if you're using a weapon that's not your packed weapon. And you can change that for a bonus action. So. I think for the most part, you wouldn't use True Strike, though it is an option here. Maybe other people can think through how True Strike would be better. The ideal attack for us at this level would be if we can move next to two targets that are within five feet of each other. 
make sure that they're both within five feet of our character. We move in, we attack the first target, and then we use the cleave feature to attack the second target and do D12 of extra damage. It's pretty good for level two. Archon is a Warlock Paladin combo. That combo has been reliably good for years now. At range, just walk in slinging Eldritch Blasts. In melee, we're a tank. Thrash the enemies with our great axe. Have all kinds of fun. Enemies die pretty fast at this level. The idea that we're going to do a lot of cleaving is limited. Okay? When it goes off, it's pretty cool. All right, let's get on to level three. We're going to add Armor of Agathis. We're going to get some stuff now that's going to make this spell a cornerstone of how we play. We'll pick up two more invocations. And they're not the invocations that you're going to think or that most people are going to pick at level two. There are so many good invocations now at level two, I can't believe it. What we're going to take on Archon is Fiendish Vigor. That allows us to cast the False Life spell anytime we want on ourselves at will for the maximum hit points. 2d4 plus 4 means we get 12 hit points, 12 temporary hit points whenever we want. We're also going to take Otherworldly Leap. That allows us to cast the Jump spell on ourselves. It's not concentration. And for the next minute, we can give up 10 feet of movement for an extra 30 foot leap. So good. So good, so good, so good. We're going to take these two invocations. We also get that second packed spell slot that refreshes on a short rest. So now we've really got more spells at level three than most casters have, especially since we can refresh those two slots on a short rest. So let's look at Armor of Agathus. It says protective magical frost surrounds you. Gain five temporary hit points. If a creature hits you with a melee attack roll before the spell ends, you reflect five cold damage back on them. Notice it only affects melee attack rolls, not ranged, not spells, not anything else. Has to be a melee attack roll. The spell ends early if you have no temporary hit points. That's worded differently than it used to be. It doesn't specify where those temporary hit points have to come from. So now, as combat preparation, we can cast Armor of Agathis, and then we can cast False Life. The duration on False Life is instantaneous. You gain the temporary hit points. They don't go away till you lose them. There's not a duration of an hour or something like that. Armor of Agathis only lasts an hour, but once you cast False Life, you choose to use those 12 temporary hit points. You can't have five and then add 12 more to it. It doesn't work like that. You can only have one instance of temporary hit points. But the way Armor of Agathis is worded now, it doesn't care where those temporary hit points come from. So we're going to bring it from False Life, 12 temporary hit points that we can use, and five reflected damage from Armor of Agathis. Um, the jump spell, again, you touch a willing creature. In this case, that willing creature has to be yourself. The Otherworldly Leap only lets you cast Jump on yourself. It's not like having infinite jumps and you can cast them on all your friends, uh, but you can only affect uh, yourself with it. But okay, it's as many jump spells as you want on yourself, and it's basically giving us an extra 20 feet of movement, and that 20 feet of movement is special because we can jump over difficult terrain. It's really good. I think uh, if people leave comments for this, I expect that some people will debate Devil Sight. Devil Sight is ridiculously good invocation. We don't have dark vision as a human. If we take Devil Sight, we solve that problem and we solve it times 10, right? We get dark vision out to 120 feet that not only goes through dim light and darkness, but also magical dim light and darkness. It's unique in the game in a way that it's just solves so many problems it's fantastic i want it i want devil sight but i think the other two invocations for this particular character and the way that we're going to build it are better so i'm going to use goggles of night to solve the dark vision problem and we're going to wait till later to get devil sight agonizing blast the same thing this is a trademark warlock feature but we've only got one bolt of eldritch blast at this point so with Agonizing Blast, we can wait. Again, these are two trademark Warlock invocations. We're going to want them. But at level three, I feel like the interaction between the Armor of Agathus and False Life is way too good to pass up. And remember, in the middle of combat, 
if we have those 12 temporary hit points and then we have seven and then we have three and we're about to lose them, we can cast false life as an action in the middle of combat, go back to 12 temporary hit points. It means that we're not taking damage against our real hit points in combat and lets armor of Agathus last a lot longer. An interaction is too good to pass up. And the extra 20 feet of mobility, the fact that we can jump over difficult terrain, again, I value it a lot. At level four, we get our subclass for Warlock. We're gonna take the Archfey Patron. At this point, Archon's gonna discover that that little statue that she's been talking to is actually linked to this powerful Fey spirit, Azaran. And Azaran wants to make a deal. Power for um, service. Okay. Now, some people might say there's going to be a worship problem here. You can't pick a patron for your warlock class and still have your paladin stuff. For me, until a paladin picks their subclass, they really haven't committed to that worship level of being a paladin. So I don't think there's any problem with the worship. Uh, but if there is and your GM wants you to resolve that within your character, you could say that the paladin worships Bahamut, the god of dragons, the Fey Spirit could be a Fey Dragon. So you worship Bahamut, that's a dragon. You worship Azaran, that's a dragon. Shouldn't be any conflicts there. Or you could ignore it altogether. The personality now comes together. We made Archon with a personality meant for the Fey, and that's how she's going to behave. It's going to be so much fun. The spell list for Arch Fey in 2024, uh, we get Calm Emotions, Fairy Fire, Misty Step, Misty Step is a fantastic addition. Sleep is situationally can be good. Uh, at level five, we get Blink and Plant Growth, but then we'll also have Counter Spell. I can't imagine that we're gonna wanna cast Blink or Plant Growth instead of Counter Spell. Um, again, Blink could be situationally good. I don't know. I, I feel like you're gonna wanna save it for the highly impactful Counter Spells, or you're gonna use it for an upcast third level Armor of Agathus that's gonna be reflecting 15 hit points by that level. So a lot of these spells are, are okay, but I don't really see us using them. Same thing at level seven, we get greater invisibility, but we wanna be seen, we wanna be hit. In solo boss fights, greater invisibility will be good, but otherwise we're not gonna use it. Dominate person and seeming, those again can have situationally useful applications at higher level. I would give this spell list a five out of 10 for us, it's okay, it's nothing to write home about. But um, certainly Fairy Fire, Misty Step, those things uh, can, can be very good when we need them. We can also take another spell, and at this level, we get level two spells. We can take Mirror Image. If we're in a particular combat, and it's looking like we're gonna take a lot of damage, we can Mirror Image. Now, if they miss us because of a Mirror Image, we don't mind that. If they miss us because we have our armor class, we don't mind that. If they hit us, we have armor Vagathus to reflect damage. So it's um, it, it has a good synergy with what we want to do anyway, but I would only cast Mirror Image if it was really sort of a desperate looking combat where you were expecting to, to really take a lot of hits. Um, and that would allow you to extend your armor Vagathus past the first few rounds where you're going to be taking a lot of attack rolls. Steps of the Fey. We get the ability to use Misty Step a number of times equal to our Charisma modifier, which is three. We get three free Misty Steps per day. Oh my goodness. Wow. This is why we picked this class. It's good with our personality. Three free Misty Steps. <laughs> As if that's not good enough, every time we do the Misty Step, whether it's part of this ability or just any time we cast Misty Step at all, we can pick one of two things. Immediately after we teleport, somebody that we can see within 10 feet gains temporary hit points. That could also be us. We get down to that last one or two hit points on Armor of Agathus. We're out of, you know, almost out of our temporary hit points, but Agathus is still on. We can teleport out of a bad situation and give hit points to ourselves. But alternately, if the, the monk or cleric or somebody else in the, in the party is getting ambushed in there, you know, away from us. We can Misty Step out of where we're at, give them temporary hit points, go over to attack that enemy. It's fantastic. Taunting Step, I see very few situations where I would rather do Taunting Step than something else. 
But situationally, if you're surrounded by a bunch of stuff, you could teleport 30 feet away, um, make it so that they have disadvantage against everything but you, and, and just go somewhere else and not be surrounded. Maybe it's good, but it does allow wisdom save, so it's not very reliable. But uh, but yeah, getting free temporary hit points with every Misty Step is, is <laughs> it's so good. It's for a level three ability, I feel like it's strong. Not game breaking, not broken, but just good and good within this group. It also allows you to escape grapples. Something comes up, grapples you, starts pulling you in. Uh, maybe a monster is going to eat you next round because it's got you grappled and it's you know pulling you up to its maw, and you just go Misty Step. I'm not there. Done. It's a way that tanks can solve that problem of, of getting eaten, for example. You do have to be able to see the square, so if you've already been swallowed, you at least have to you know, cut a big enough hole to see out of it, I guess, in order to use Misty Step to get out. But um, it, gets, uh, it just gets you out of a lot of sticky situations. All right, taunting could be strong in, in certain situations. By level three, I think we have to change our Weapon Mastery. Um, the Cleric will be getting Spike Growth at level 4. If they cast Spike Growth, we want to be able to push things around onto the Spike Growth. So let's take a Pike and take the Pike Weapon Mastery, and that way when Spike Growth is the appropriate thing for the party, when that's the good tactic, Archon can just use the pike to shove things out into the spike growth and help do tons of damage and strand monsters somewhere in the spike growth so that they have to walk back out of it and take more damage. Push at this point becomes better than topple. We have a ranged damage dealer, so topple isn't always good anyway. Uh, so I think we give up the topple. We keep the cleave with the great axe, and then we have the choice. Level 5, we're going to take our fourth level of Warlock. That gives us a feat. We're going to take Inspiring Leader at this level. There is a ton of stuff we could take. Warcaster is by far the best feat in the game for a caster, but it's so good that really I want to do builds where we don't use it. If we're using our reactions to cast spells mostly on this character and we're not really planning to use a shield, we're going to use a two-handed weapon, it opens up this idea that, okay, we're not going to do an important concentration spell um, we've got one that we can use, but we're not going to rely on it. We do want to get hit to reflect damage with armor of Agathis, so we don't want to have, you know, this reliance on concentration like a lot of other casters are going to have. So we're going to skip Warcaster, we're going to skip a lot of the other stuff that could be really good, and instead we're going to go with Inspiring Leader as a choice for the party. After any long or short rest, we can give out temporary hit points. Already at level 5, it's going to be 9 hit points for us. We're going to add plus 1 to our Charisma, which now gives us a plus 4 modifier. Level 5 for the party, plus 4 means 9 hit points for everybody. Armor of Agathis at this level is already giving us 10. False Life is giving us 12. So we're going to, on a short rest, we're going to cast Armor of Agathis, False Life that up to 12, and this is going to be a wasted ability for us. But the rest of the group... There's three other characters in Azurin's Aspirants. That's 27 free temporary hit points that we're going to give out every time we take a rest. So this is a sacrifice for the group. It'll be good now. It'll be good at every level. And it gives us that plus one charisma that we need. And occasionally we do want to take abilities or feats or whatever for the sake of the party. So that's what we're doing here. All right. Level six. We're going to take Warlock five, and that's a huge level. This allows Thirsting Blade, which gives us the extra attack. Now we're actually acting like all of the other melee classes in the game. If we attack, we can attack again. Let's go. We can also pick up that Agonizing Blast Invocation. We got our second Eldritch Blast Beam at level 5. And now at level 6, we can add that ad, uh, Agonizing Blast Invocation onto it. So it, pretty shortly after it, it becomes better as a spell. It also becomes better with the damage. Um, I think it's right on. It's, it's a good path. It's no problem to get that here instead of back at second level. With third level spells, we're going to take Hypnotic Pattern and Counterspell. We're going to get rid of Hex at this point. Uh, we could keep Hex and get rid of a different spell. Um, it's up to you. We can't get rid of Bless, for example, because Bless is within the Paladin group of spells and we have to get um, counterspell within the warlock group of spells. So 
Kick a spell out, whichever one you want. I'm getting rid of Hex in this build. The second attack per turn ramps up the damage. Agonizing Blast is better threat from the, from the Eldritch Blast Beams. So level six in action. We're gonna use that Blade Ward again before combat. Armor of Agathus is not concentration. Jump is not concentration. We can get all three of these things on us as combat prep. Armor of Agathus, clearly you cast it, you've got an hour to find a combat. Jump is one of those things where you have to talk to your DM and find out if he allows it for continuous casting. If they don't allow it for continuous casting, it's no problem, it's only a bonus action to cast. Easy to cast that. You just can't also, uh, let's say you go into combat or get surprised and the only thing you have up is Armor of Agathus. On your first turn, you can cast Blade Ward because it's a cantrip. You can cast Jump as a bonus action. You only cast one leveled spell in the turn. It's no problem to get both of those things up and running on the first turn of combat. Um, we're going to move in with Jump. If we can't close the distance, 50 foot of movement, we're going to attack with Eldritch Blast. If we do close, we're going to do two attacks against an enemy. If we can close and also be within five feet of an enemy and be able to use the Cleave ability and Cleave uh, with our Great Axe from one to another, fantastic. We're going to do that. We still have a bonus action, and we still have a reaction for shield, hellish rebuke, whatever we can do here. The ideal turn, of course, is to move into combat, attack, use your um, cleave ability to attack a nearby target, and then use your second extra attack on whichever target makes the most sense. With bonus actions, we have hex, misty step, packed weapon. We could refresh jump if we need to. Reactions, we've got the shield for higher armor class if we're taking a lot of hits. We have Hellish Rebuke just to do damage. And I love Hellish Rebuke in this build. If you're fighting against uh, an enemy and they have like, um, bloodied is now a condition, you can ask your GM if they're less than half hit points. Uh, characters attacking you, they have low hit points. You just let them hit you. Let the hit go through. Reflect 10 damage from armor, or 15 damage now from armor of Agathus at this level. Hit him with Hellish Rebuke. That would be uh, 22 potential damage at this level, 22 average damage for a Hellish Rebuke. So you're hitting them for 37 damage because they hit you in melee. Uh, it, it's, it's a way to kill enemies when it's not even your turn. So it's pretty fantastic. I like it. You could also keep Hex as a bonus action if you really wanted to keep that. You've got these Misty Steps now that you can cast all over the place. And remember, because we're, we want to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat and we're acting like a fighter-type character, casting Misty Step doesn't interfere with our action sequence at all because we're not, we don't want to use a magic action with our magic sequence. Uh, you can only cast one leveled spell, Misty Step, no problem. Now we've got attacks to make. Or we use the Eldritch Blast Cantrip. No interference whatsoever. So good. Uh, by this level, it should frequently be possible either for Arcan herself to grab and grapple a target and move it closer together, or for Tenement, the barbarian monk, to grab a target and move two things close together. So that's going to be part of this group's gimmick. Grab an enemy, move it within five feet of another enemy, hit, hit the other enemy, go back to the first one, kill it, trigger another attack. Just sequences like that where we're just mauling two targets if they're within five feet of each other. Again, the group doesn't have to do that, but when they can do it, there's always going to be something there to make that a lot of fun. If we look at our level six, just with no bonuses at all, we get a 78% chance to hit. If we have bless and advantage, we can move that all the way to 94% chance to hit. So uh, with this party, it should be possible to hit whenever we need to. But um, even if we just take the base chance of 78% to hit average armor class, we've got two attacks that each do a D12 plus five at this level. And that plus five, I'm assuming, is plus four from your charisma and plus one for a plus one weapon. So D12 plus five for each strike. Maybe half the time we could get off a cleave attack. I don't know. So 18 reliable damage per turn and then fly at five cleave damage if we get it on average, you know, half the time. So at 6th level, 23 damage per round reliably. Doesn't seem like a lot, but remember, this character is doing a lot of very effective stuff with Armor of Agathus and Reactions. Every target that hits us in melee is going to take 15 damage back when it's not our turn, 
And if we get off a Hellish Rebuke, that's going to be another 22 damage when it's not our turn. So this character at 6th level, I would say, could easily be in the 50 damage per round range if using a couple instances of Agathis or Agathis plus Hellish Rebuke or something like that. So a, a bunch of the damage comes out when it's not our turn. With Blade Ward and Shield, and possibly even if you need to use it the dodge action, uh, Archon is very hard to hit. By now we should have full plate armor, 18 base armor class, with a shield that goes up to 23. With Blade Ward minus D4, it's making our armor class on average 25.5 effectively. And if we dodge, they have disadvantage trying to get a 25 or 26 to hit is pretty hard for the enemy mobs. So if we don't want to get hit, we really don't need to get hit. On the other hand, when we're down to a couple enemies, we don't want to avoid those hits at all. We want them. As long as they're melee attacks, let them land. <clears throat> it's not a problem. Reflect that armor of Agathis damage back on them. We're going to have synergy with our teammate, Aklea the Cleric. <clears throat> that character can put Warding Bond onto Archon so that when we take damage, it's going to trigger the armor of Agathis, but we're only going to take half that damage and we're going to pass half of it over to Aklea. Aklea will also have the Interception Fighter feat, so we get hit for, let's say we get hit for 20 damage, we can reduce it by 8 damage on average from the Interception feat. Now it's 12, that 12 is divided by 2, so Archon only takes 6 of the damage, passes over 6 to the Cleric, and in that way we can make Armor of Agathis last for 3, 4, 5 hits. So let yourself get hit. If you've got over 10 temporary hit points, just let the hits come through. Do that reflective damage. Don't be afraid to toss in that Hellish Rebuke and make that the reason to slaughter things outright. Fun stuff. So also, we see a picture here of Archon at 6th level. Uh, you know, looking better. She's got some upgraded plate mail here. We still see the big smile on her face. We, I gave her a little uh, tiara so that you know that she's a noble. I don't know. She just looks like a ton of fun to play. Carting her ba big old battle axe, uh, great axe into, into combat, uh, just to cleave as many enemies as she can. Items that we'd be looking for in this level range, this is sort of like 2 to 10 level range. Rod of the Pact Keeper is the Warlock item that gives you plus 1 to spell DCs and plus 1 to hit with spells. So the plus 1 would apply to something like Eldritch Blast. The spell DCs apply to um, any spell you have that allows a saving throw. So Rod of the Pact Keeper is good. This character doesn't need a ton of magical items to perform, so being able to, um, you know, have a Rod of the Pact Keeper is going to be good if you can get it. Magical weapons and armor are going to be fantastic. Uh, you could get a magical shield. We're not intending to use a shield very often on this character. I would rather have an animated shield. That could be really good. So we could get an extra couple armor class without having to actually hold the shield. So take a look at that if you want to. Or an item like a cloak or ring of deflection could be good. Increasing our armor class and saves is always something that we find desirable. At this point, we still want the goggles of night or even the belt of dwarven kind could give us dark vision. We won't need it for much longer. We're going to get that invocation uh, quite soon. But um, for now, we got to hold out. So role-playing at level 6. Uh, if we talk about our team, right, we've got a four-player team, the Aspirants, they're ready to go. Archon's going to be watching this uh, tenement. He, remember, he's the uh, way of the drunken monk, and he's a tortle class, so he's this, like, tipsy tortle that's just staggering around. And, uh, you know, she, remember, she's going to be really positive, kind of whimsical, and she's going to be talking uh, inspirationally, trying to get the group pumped up before combat, right? Hey, are you ready to go, you crazy turtle? We got this. We're the blessed of Azaran. We never falter. Uh, with her will, we always prevail. And, uh, oh, there goes the turtle. You all better catch up. She's got the leap spell, the jump spell, right? So she just takes off, takes a huge leap forward into combat, dares the other players to get to keep up with her. She's got this great axe raised in the air, and she's got uh, this armor of Agathis, so she's trailing like this silvery mist of frost as she goes. <laughs> I just imagine this being like 
so much fun to imagine how she would enter combat and how she would look just dancing around, slashing out at all these enemies, not caring whether she gets hit or not. Fantastic. From level six and up, there's really, um, in the past, I would almost always have recommended to go with Paladin, get Paladin six, get that aura by level 11, adding your charisma to other players saving throws is game breaking it's 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 it skews the statistics so far in favor of the players that um you know it's almost a must have in high level parties but uh there's so much good stuff in warlock now um at with the 2024 rules level 10 is going to give us beguiling defense from our subclass which is great with this build level 11 is going to give us a third spell slot for our pack spells more reactions for every combat at the highest level fantastic level 12 is going to give us access to three attacks per turn used to be that was only with the fighter build now we can get up to three attacks with a warlock build it feels really good to stay with warlock so that's what we're going to do level seven warlock six we're going to pick up the fly spell that's going to allow us to make basically we're going to make the turtle fly or ourselves to catch a flying enemy grapple them bring them down to the ground something like that Misty Escape, uh, we get Misty Escape with our uh, subclass. Now we can cast Misty Step as a reaction. So we've already got all these powerful reaction spells. We're going to add another one. Misty Step as a reaction when we take damage. So if we're in a really bad situation, the first thing that actually does hit us, so much crazy good stuff that we can do. Misty Step out as a reaction. Go somewhere else. We've got four things to pick from now. We could pick the temporary hit points or the taunt. Now we've got disappearing step. We could go in invisible altogether. We could do dreadful step that does damage to somebody on the way out. If you're surrounded, you're low on life, you don't have armor of Agathis, you're, you're into your hit points and you're close to death, take that hit, get out of there, disappear, become invisible, get away. Really good. If the enemy that's attacking you or something else in the area is almost dead, leave. Dreadful step. 2d10 psychic damage. They do get a wisdom save. But again, if we've got it, we're going to have good charisma. The DC on that's going to be pretty high. If we've got that rod, we're going to be even higher. It's fantastic. Dreadful step. Try to kill somebody on your way out. If not, if you're surrounded and it's like, uh, maybe you're doing a one shot with this character and it's one of these like gauntlet style things where there's tons of enemies and it's really super hard. Instead, you misty step out, you use the taunt feature, and now those characters maybe can't even get to you anymore and they have disadvantage against everybody that's not you. So the flexibility now with this character, what we're bringing to the team is just going up and up and up and up and up. Only at level seven. It's, it's really, really uh, a lot of different um, things that we could do with this. At level 8, we're going to take Warlock 7. It gets us 4th level spell slots. We're going to take De uh, Banishment as our spell. It's also another Invocation. Now we're going to grab Devil Sight. We can throw away those Goggles of Night forever. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Our face subclass gives us greater invisibility as part of that spell list that we got. Uh, it doesn't remember the greater invisibility doesn't make a character undetectable So if you're noisy in your armor, you're still noisy in your armor It does give advantage on attacks and disadvantage on attacks against you which could situationally be something that you really need So we could use it. We could not use it, but basically we want to be seen. We want to be hit It's not going to be a game-changing spell for us like it could be for other builds um, against a single boss, like a dragon or something like that, I could see very easily saying, okay, we're going to do the improved invisibility. I don't want to be the target for this boss. Let it hit the turtle, and then we just focus on single target damage. At level 9, we're going to be Warlock 8. We're going to pick up Dispel Magic. Uh, for feat options at level 8, Great Weapon Master looks so good. The strength isn't really helping us but it gives you proficiency bonus to your damage for all attacks made within your attack action. The cleave feature happens during your attack action, to my understanding, because you attack a target and you can immediately make another attack roll with, uh, to a target that's within five feet. And then you can go back to making your extra attack against whichever target you want. So all of those attacks 
would have great weapon master damage added to them. Adding that two or three times a turn means nine damage on average, 12 damage if all three hits um, land. It's really a lot of damage. But competing against that for our attention is just capping our charisma at 20. And 20 charisma, getting that plus five, it affects our attack rolls. We get a plus one to our attack rolls. We're getting a plus one damage from all the, the uh, because we have five charisma, plus five instead of plus four. Eldritch Blast attacks benefit by that plus one. Spell DC goes up, spell checks go up. So it, in the end, when you think about all of the things that the extra two charisma are gonna give this character, we really have to cap our charisma at 20 at level nine. And that's gonna be a better choice for now. Next time we get a feat though, Great Weapon Master is gonna be in. If you need to think about how much the plus one matters when it comes to spell save DC, we'll just take a quick look at it. People think about this in the wrong way a lot, I, I've seen, where they say, look, every number on a D20 is a 5% chance to succeed on a save. So if you increase your spell DC by one, it's just one result on a D20 that won't work. It's not that big of a deal. But you're looking at it in the wrong way. Statistically, what's interesting to us is not the chance that they will save. It's what is the likelihood that they will roll a successful save and therefore either thwart our spell or reduce the effect. So if we look at it that way, when you say I've increased my spell DC by one, yep, it's only one more number that works. But if we just say, look, we could take an enemy that has a plus five save and if we take our DC from 16 to 17, with a DC 16, there's 10 results that will save. Anything 11 to 20 is gonna be a save. If we increase that DC to 17, now there's one more result that doesn't work, but we've cut down the successful results from 10 to nine, and that's a 10% less chance to succeed. It's only 5% more chance when you look at it as a D20, but it's a 10% reduction, they will succeed 10% less, okay? If we look at it at the extreme end of it, let's say there's a character that has a plus zero save just to keep things easy, and we take our DC from 19 to 20. If the DC is 19, only a 19 or 20 will save, there's only two results. If we get that to DC 20, there's only one result that'll save. That's a 50% reduction in their chance of success. And if we get that all the way up to a DC 21, it's a 100% chance because there's no chance for them to save. So if we look at it in terms of reducing their chances to succeed, DC, the more you can increase the DC on your spell, the more effect it has on the game. Really important on all spell casting characters to try to get your DC as high as you can. At level 10, we're gonna take level nine Warlock. We're gonna take Synaptic Static. And now coming into a combat, this might be the spell that we wanna cast on the first round. Move, Synaptic Static, do whatever for reactions. And then on round two, start your sequence of moving into melee range and tanking and attacking. Synaptic Static is an 8d6 fireball that does psychic damage. It's fireball sized. And it has these lingering after effects where characters that fail a save uh, have a minus 1d6 to all their attacks, checks, and concentrations uh, saves. It doesn't give uh, minus 1d6 to all saves, just concentration saves, but this is really a big deal. It also stacks with Blade Ward, so now if you affect them with Synaptic Static and you run into melee and they make a melee attack or any attack roll, right? It's gonna get a minus d4 and also a minus d6 and those two things together are minus six to attack that's so powerful talk about controlling your enemies that gives you really strong control over your enemies we can also pick up another invocation here we'll take life drinker that gives us another plus one d6 psychic damage on weapon hit way too good to pass up it also allows us an option to heal this character is intending to often be operating with temporary hit points, but there are gonna be combats where you get slammed through the temporary hit points and take damage. And then we could trigger this to heal ourselves. It does, in the new writing, we have to use our hit dice in order to do that. 
but it does allow us a way to heal in combat when that's relevant. I consider that the, the life drinker, I mean, the, the, the life gain should be the reason to take life drinker, but it's the other way around. The extra damage is the reason to take life drinker. The healing is just a trinket effect that may be relevant. Okay, we also get contact patron and uh, we get to contact other plane once per day and we auto succeed on the save that we have to make against negative effects, which is fantastic. All right, at Warlock level, uh, level 11, we'll get Warlock 10 and we're gonna get two really interesting fun things here, right? So we're gonna get uh, the Minor Illusion Cantrip, for example, we can, we can use that, that's nice. But what we're looking for here is this beguiling defense. Beguiling defense is going to mean that the patron teaches us how to guard our body and mind. And we'll be immune to the charm condition from now on. From level 11 onward, we just can't be charmed. Which, in a subtle way, is extremely powerful in the game. When your frontline tank is immune to charm, uh, we also love to be immune to fear. We don't quite get that, but uh, it's really good. Now, we get another reaction. Immediately after a creature we can see hits with an attack roll. Doesn't have to be melee attack roll, can be any attack roll. We take a reaction to reduce the damage by half. Force the attacker to make a wisdom save against our spell DC, and if they fail, they take psychic damage equal to the damage that we take. Once you use it as a reaction, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest or expend a pack magic slot to restore use of it. This is to stop crits. If we get critically hit, maybe there's 60 damage coming at us, we just say, nope, it's 30. Furthermore, the cleric still has the interaction with interception that we could potentially reduce that damage. We still have potentially warding bond to take half damage. Beguiling defense does not say it gives you resistance to the damage. It says the damage is cut in half. So those two things will stack. The resistance that you get from warding bond kicks in. So imagine it goes from 60 to 30 reaction from the cleric takes it down to 22. We cut that in half down to 11, 60 damage hit instead do, does 11. If it's a melee attack, we get to reflect back damage with the uh, armor of Agathus. Pretty strong. If we end now, we've got two options, right? We get two really good things here. The two really good options we get, anytime we have a short rest, if we have an available spell slot, we can restore Beguiling Defense. If we have a open spell slot before we have a long rest, then we can use that contact other plane if we haven't used our fifth level spell slot, right? So now it, it's you don't even have to worry. You don't have to try to force fit your reaction spells into the combat. If you have a spell slot left over, you recharge Beguiling Defenses. If you have a spell slot left over before a long rest, you cast Contact Other Plane. Fun stuff. Level 12, Warlock 11, we get a Teleportation Circle. This just gives us a teleportation that allows the party to move around without having to travel everywhere. Also gives us our third packed slot. This is such a big deal. Now we have three of these fifth level spells slots that we can use for reactions in every combat and they refresh on a short rest. We also get Mystic Arcanum. It's a sixth level spell. We can cast it once per day, but note it, with Warlocks, this does not give you a sixth level spell slot. You can't upcast Armor of Agathis. You can only cast the spell that you take with the Arcanum. It's fine. We're gonna take Tasha's bul Bubbling Cauldron. This spell is, I think, so much fun and powerful for a group that's in a campaign. You cast Bubbling Cauldron, it's potions of healing. It could also be growth, potions of climbing to get a climb speed, any kind of damage resistance, fire, lightning. If you're gonna fight a particular type of dragon, just make five potions of resistance. Could give water breathing. Um, I think this group is always gonna wanna have a bunch of potions of growth and hill giant strength. Um, so that the characters that want to grapple can get 21 strength or grow to large size. And you could just get them for free every day. Five growth one day, five hill giant strength the next day, five healing potions the next day. Just free potions every day. Let's say you get two weeks of downtime. Make all those potions and sell them. 
make a whole bunch of money in your downtime. The spell is just so much fun. Level 13, Warlock 12. We're going to take Devouring Blade, and now we get three attacks per turn. So good. <laughs> so good. Three Great Axe uh, slashes per turn. Fantastic. We also get a feat at this level, and we're going to take that Great Weapon Master. It gives us a plus one in strength, which is okay. It's not really helping us that much, but we get it. We'll take it. Alternately, we could take something like Resilient Constitution if this character was being played as a standalone character in a group where we really did need to maintain concentration on a key spell. Um, we could here take Resilient Con. So level 13 in action. Archon is this melee mobile bruiser. Um, think of her like a tank or a battleship, right? High mobility, high speed, uh, really potent offense wherever she wants to put it. Really good defense, hard to take down. So all of those things together, mobility, offense, defense, and these reactions that are going to be really strong. Reactions for shield if we don't want to be hit. Misty Step if we do get hit and don't want to be in that combat. Hellish Rebuke if we just want to sling a whole bunch of damage. Um, we could t even take an Attack of Opportunity, but with this character I feel like there's so much more powerful things to do. Or if an enemy wizard's doing something really nasty, throw out that counter spell. The reactions on this character using the spell slots are just huge. Enemies should miss a lot, but if we do take damage from Agathus, doing damage back makes it all worth it. Prep spell, same way. Blade Ward, Armor of Agathus at this level is doing 25 damage. We have that jump spell. Uh, around for us, same as it was before. Move forward, use that jump, get into position, and then that first round, if you need to prep with Blade Ward, fine. If Hypnotic Pattern, Synaptic Static, Banishment, whatever one of these spells is going to provide the best battlefield control effect, that first round, cast it if you need to. Save the spell slots if you don't. The ideal attack round here is five attacks. Go into a combat with two targets close together. Attack the main one. As soon as you do, use your cleave attack on the second target. Now you take your other two attacks against whichever target is weaker, and if you kill them, Great Weapon Master allows you to use a bonus action to trigger another attack uh, on whichever target is still standing. So up to five attacks, three reliably, because it's just attack and then two extra attacks for our Warlock in, um, invocations. But we could get potentially two more attacks from Cleave and Great Weapon Master feats. Bonus actions, if you kept the Hex spell, we could do that if that was a better concentration spell for us. We got Misty Step, Pack Weapon, Jump, Reactions, we got Shield, Hellish Rebuke, Counter Spell, Beguiling Defense to half the damage once a day until we refresh it with a Pack Slot. Lots of tools in the toolbox. Crater Invisibility can be used with Agathus still up. Uh, Agathus isn't concentration. It does get rid of Blade Ward for us, but that's fine. We, we'll be invisible. 95% chance to hit with Bless and Advantage from Greater Invisibility. If we look at a boss fight here where we're invisible using a plus two weapon, damage would be D12 from the Great Axe, plus one D6 for each hit from Life Drinker, plus five from Great Weapon Master, our proficiency bonus at this level's plus five. Plus five from Charisma, plus two from the weapon, means that each attack that lands does 22 average damage. Three attacks at 22, potentially a cleave and a bonus attack for 17 each. Um, gives you 100 damage. 63 of that damage is fully reliable with three attacks. The other is situational. You may or may not get it. So you could do up to 95 damage per round with a tank, with your tank character. And then when it's not your turn, you're going to do 25 damage back to every melee attacker that hits you. you got tricks to extend your armor of Agathus. You've got Hellish Rebuke if you just want to do damage to kill an enemy. If you use the Hex, you can increase your damage by, this is wrong, it's only 3d6 because if you did get the extra two attacks, you could only attack the Hex target three times. You would have to attack the other target two other times. So it's just not worth it. Uh, this is just kind of to prove out that among all the spells that you could be casting, 
Hex is not the one that you would want. Which is unfortunate. I wish it was better. <coughs> we can also move enemies. We've still got that push with the pike. We make the cauldron once a day. We get these giant strength potions that have 21 strength. We have potion of growth. So if we need to grapple at this level, grab an enemy, move them around, no problem. Put two of them close together. Let the whole party succeed. That's going to be Tenement's job more than Archon, but hey, if you need to get it, we can get it. And remember that attacks can be separated by movement. So if you're using your three attacks, the first attack could be with a free hand to grapple. You move the target, you let go of the target, grab your weapon in two hands, make two more attacks, get your cleave attack off. You can still grapple with this character and move and get all of the benefit of <clears throat> the rounds that you want to take. Tanking hits. You want to take hits. You don't want to be hit. If they miss you, it's fine. If there's tons of enemies attacking, you put up a shield, don't get hit, it's fine. If they do hit you, let them take the armor of Agathus damage back if they can, if it's melee attack. Um, decide whether to use Beguiling Defense to half it. I would typically only use the Beguiling Defense on crits, like I said, because uh, you can't really avoid a critical hit. It's always going to hit you and do high damage. Just cut it in half. Just That's your method to stop critical hit damage. You also have Hellish Rebuke that you can use, uh, counter spells, shields. If temporary hit points are less than 10, think about when to use shield to avoid tax if you want to extend your Agathus. You can cast False Life in the middle of combat if there's a ton of small enemies. Um, I can think of a scenario where there's a bunch of little guys that are blocking your path. You could just run past them, trigger attacks of opportunity intentionally from all of them somewhere within your sequence if you get low on your hit points. Refresh that with false life as your action for the turn, continue to use your movement to trigger more attacks of opportunity, and all these little characters will kill themselves with 25 hit points of reflected damage. Some characters aren't meant to do attacks of opportunity like wizards and you know certain rogue characters, uh, rangers, things like that that are in melee. Just walk past them, trigger the attack of opportunity intentionally, let them make it for low damage, and then smash them back for 25 hit points. So intentionally triggering AOs at this character is completely a legitimate tactic. Your GM will stop making attacks of opportunity against you. Uh, the monsters notice that everybody's dying from the Agathus, so we just stop making attacks of opportunity. So you're such a bad target, the GM doesn't even want to hit you. Fantastic. And you can also recast if you, let's say you take a, a bunch of hits in a turn and Armor of Agathus goes away. You can also use one of your fifth level spell slots to just re-up it. Remember that it's 25 reflected damage, but it's also basically a 25 hit point healing spell because you get those temporary hit points. Worth casting that in battle in your action sometimes. Conclusions. As we see Archon here, man, ready. Just ready for combat ready to go items that we're looking for at these i call them like i guess you'd call them tier three levels so somewhere 10 to 15 be looking for rod of the pact keeper plus two or plus three if you can get it magical great axe we want to have at least a plus two or plus three weapon at this point any plate armor if we can get mithril or something that avoids disadvantage that's a bonus animated shield is still good uh, belt of giant strength the barbarian in this group the Belt of Giant Strength is one of the most overpowered items in the game. Some GMs won't even give it out because it's too good. But assuming that you're in a normal campaign where that's something that you could buy or quest for or somehow access, um, somewhere in these mid-levels, I expect that Tenement would be upgrading from, let's say, a 23 strength giant belt to a maybe a 27 strength belt, something like that. Uh, if that happens, he should give the belt to Archon. She should use that as an item and get that extra strength. There's tons of situations where that could help. Also, boots of speed, anything that lets you fly, increase your AC, increase your speed. Potions of speed, um, things like that. Consumable items are also fun. Roleplay at level 13. Uh, I think the character's as whimsical as she's ever been, maybe even more so because of all the Fey influence, right? Halleck, that last combat, you did so much damage, you almost did more damage than I did. Right? you got a plan for this next fight. There's a lot of cultists in there. They've summoned some demons. We've seen it. We know it. They're going to summon more demons. This is going to be just nasty. What do you think? 
looks at her little stone dragon. What do you think? What do you think? What do you, what should we do? What do you think? Oh yeah. Yeah, that works. Azrin says the plan is overwhelming force. I'm going in. In five minutes. I need a snack first. Have fun kids, figure out what you're going to do. You know, I, I don't think she's big into planning, but she'll participate. Um, her strategy is going to be just cast your prepared spells, run in face first, trigger the traps, trigger the ready to actions. We don't care. Azran will pr protect us and it'll be whatever it's going to be. Out of combat, I think some, some, some mischief with this character would be fun. I mean, she's somebody's mom. She's like this uh, middle-aged woman who's like always telling bad jokes. Uh, maybe she's tying people's shoelaces together or putting bitter stuff in the food for the night or filling somebody's helmet with water so that the next morning when they put it on, they get drenched. Uh, I wouldn't do things to make her untrustworthy or make the party hate you, but definitely I would play this character as... Uh, shenanigans, <laughs> mischief behind the scenes. Um, in social interactions, though, she can drop all that, get serious, straighten her back, and uh, be a noble, and you know, do those persuasion roles or intimidation roles with good intent. Doesn't have to be foolish in those situations. I think after 13, it's a big jumping-off point again. Uh, warlocks will eventually get seventh, eighth, ninth level arcanums. They'll get more invocations. There's an invocation that gives you True Sight, which you can pick up at Warlock 15, which is just amazing. Um, you could also go for Paladin and try to get Paladin like at least six, maybe to eight. You could have uh, epic boons that way. And the Paladin aura is still as broken as it was the last time I talked about it. Uh, so that's definitely legitimate. We could also think about seven levels of Sorcerer. The synergy as I understand it, is still there. So let's talk about it. If we were to do a level 15 one-shot, and I was to pick this character, Paladin 13, Paladin 1, Warlock 12, we take this character to the same place that we were at level 13 for this whole guide. Add two more levels of Sorcerer. That gives a meta magic. We're going to take Extend Spell and Quicken Spell. You can extend Armor Vagathus. Now it lasts two hours instead of one hour. Key point, it'll last through a short rest. You do a combat, car cast armor of Agathus as prep, combat lasts a minute. You take a short rest. You still have 59 minutes of armor of Agathus left after the short rest. It's a pretty big deal. Extend spell also has a advantage on concentration. You can, in theory, extend your blade ward. Then it lasts two minutes, and uh, you have advantage to concentration if you have to save um yeah, that's okay but extend spell and then of course quicken spell we want to be able to cast quicken eldritch blast that gives us a little bit of burst damage now the way i read all of the new stuff in 2024 font of magic for sorcerer says you can convert a spell slot to sorcery points i don't see any reason why we couldn't wake up in the morning Save one spell slot for Armor of Agathus, take two other packed level slots, convert them to sorcery points, and just start the day with 12 sorcery points. First combat we're in, we'd be weak. We're, we've, we've missed out on some of these reaction spells that we have, but we could go in with up to six quickened Eldritch Blasts for that first combat. Alternately, you could just do five points, get yourself some ability to cast Quicken um, Eldritch Blasts. That would leave you a third level pack slot. Then when you go into your short rest, you could either, if you still have it open, you could convert those for Beguiling Defense from five more sorcery points. Uh, tons of flexibility. So that gives us a bunch more offense for 15th level one shot. So the character is still everything it was at a tank, as a tank at third level. Don't care if we get hit. We want to retaliate. We want to crack back with Armor of Agathus. We want to hit with Hellish Rebuke. We've got ways to reduce all the damage that's coming in if we do get hit, or we just shield it off and don't get hit at all. Interesting character, I think. Level 21 shot. If we were to take this all the way up to level 20, I think there's really two distinct different things. I think... 
For most groups, we're going to want to do Paladin 8 with a Devotion subclass, Warlock 12 with the Fae subclass. If we're doing a level 20 one-shot, remember we could have leveled the character to Warlock 11, Paladin 7, and then take the last two levels as Warlock 12, Paladin 8, and that gives us access to two epic boon feats, one at 19, one at 20. The wording on the feats says, if you take a feat, it can be any feat. If you take a specific feat, it has to have that wording. So if it says it has to be an epic boon, that's all you can take. But if you get a feat at level 19, it can be an epic boon. If you get a feat at 20, it can be an epic boon because you meet the requirements. So we would do that with this character. That gives us an aura of, of devotion for the party. That's going to be immunity to charm for everybody. And also remember, we're going to have a 22 charisma. And that's going to give plus six to saving throws for everybody within 10 feet of us as a paladin. Big deal to have that for the group. And we're still going to do all the damage that we would have done with this character as a level 13 build. Two epic boons. I would probably pick fortitude and recovery. Just make it so this character becomes increasingly tanky. Um, again, we're sticking with the level that we had as a level uh, damage that we had at level 13 and just added on seven levels of durability, tanking, and party abilities. Stop off for just a second here. I don't know. These pictures came out great. I love the way Archon looks as a high level paladin warlock. Armor of Agathus, frost everywhere, plate mail armor, ready to leap into combat. I feel like it's such a cool character. An alternate way to build this. Again, Paladin 1, Warlock 7, where we ended up at level 13. And then add 7 levels, go Clockwork Sorcerer subclass. The Bastion of Law says you can tap into the equation of existence. You cast, you use sorcery points, 1 to 5 sorcery points. Make a ward around yourself. When you take damage, you can use that to reduce the amount of damage that you take. So now... We've added a whole bunch of sorcerer levels, sorcery points, spell slots, tons and tons of more ways to do high damage. And also on top of it, added a class feature that's gonna to add to our durability. Crazy. Now, the ward is represented. When the ward takes damage, you could expend them. This is not taking a reaction. You could use Beguiling Defense to cut the damage in half. Bastion of Law. I think the way Bastion of Law is worded, you would have to reduce the damage first before you cut it in half. But anyway, you, you have multiple things now that layer on top of each other. You still have resistance if you have a warding bond from somebody in your party. The damage goes down to nothing. So this is a damage build even more than it was at level 13. We have everything we used to have. Misty Step, Counter Spells, Shield Spells, tons of spell slots from the Sorcerer levels now that are going to let us do all of these different things multiple times per combat. We frequently should be able to achieve a full attack round and also uh, the bonus Quickened Eldritch Blasts. Eldritch Blast at this point, four beams, D10 plus... Actually, D10 plus... You no, know, it's D10 plus five with this build because we don't have the Epic Boons. 44 extra damage per round. So we could do 44 from that, 74 damage from three melee attacks. That's not any extra triggers from Cleave or anything else. 25 per Agathus hit and Hellish Rebuke at this level would be an average of 33 damage. So on a given turn, against a single target, if you really want to kill that target, Quickened Eldritch Blast, 44 damage, walk in, three hits, jump out, Take the attack of opportunity on purpose. Let them AOO you. Let it hit. 25 damage from Agathus. Hellish Rebuke. Add it all together. That'd be 176 damage in one turn. From the party tank. Not bad. Not bad. That's going to wrap up the build for Lady Archon, the Whimsical Warlock. Again, I, I like this build. I think it's fun. It's meant to have a lot of synergy with the team that we're building, the um, uh, Archons or uh, Azeron's Aspirants. Uh, Lady Archon is going to be the key part of that, the center point for the combat, the tank for the group. Please remember, hit that like button on your way out if you didn't hit it on the way in. Subscribe. 
And uh, if you've made it this far, please leave me a comment. Even if it's just a hello or anything to, to peddle this algorithm, the more likes, subscribes, and comments that we get on these uh, builds, the more people are going to see them, and the more that's going to motivate me to want to do more of them in the future and, and make it worth my time and effort to keep building these. So please do that for me for the channel. Like, subscribe, give me your comments. Let me know how I can make this more informative or entertainment for all of you. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you in the next video.